Tony and Susie were our gods. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Amen, Christians. You didn't ever dream of questioning them. And him that believeth not shall be damned. It was a collision of two very dangerous people who then created this religious foundation. And these people believed, so truly believed. They just said, well, we're going to be a commercial enterprise and make money. He had Hollywood celebrities buying the jackets. They produced a television show. This is Tony and Susan Alamo coming to you from the Grand Ole Opry House in Nashville, Tennessee. It started out looking really beautiful, but it was all facade, it was all fake. And then it just started getting worse and worse. They weren't paying the uh, employees. Essentially, it was a sweatshop. The labor department sued. The IRS started getting involved. And then he started these beatings. Alamo is accused of child abuse for allegedly ordering the beating of an 11-year-old California boy. He always wanted to torture us. It, it's like he enjoyed it. His pathology mutated. Apparently, he decided to go with little girls. He had us take nude pictures. And she was taken to be a bride. She was eight. I knew he was raping those kids and beating them because he'd done it to me. For 40 years, he basically got away with this. Tony taught his followers that the government would kill them, literally kill them. Ultimately, what will it take to catch Tony Alamo? In all of our minds, this could be Waco all over again. Evangelist compound as part of a two-year child pornography investigation. I had just turned 16 when the raid happened. It was on Tony's birthday. We were in the recreation room of Tony's home. Someone comes bursting through the door and says, they're here. There's people with guns. We have to go. I just remember looking out the window, and we were surrounded by these guys with huge guns, which were the FBI. And then we look up, and there's helicopters, and there's just all this commotion everywhere. And they had their guns out. And they told us to put our arms in the air. We just caught this out-of-body experience where I was just standing there, and I was like, this is how I'm going to die. Tony and Susan Alamo. Stay right in there with us for the next one half hour with gospel testimonies, songs, and a message. In the 60s, there were a lot of young people, the hippie movement, who came to California wanting to find a better life. During the time that we first went out, uh, the kids were singing songs that God was dead and uh, burned down the churches. And Susan Alamo would say, look at these dirty hippies out here. Look at these people. They need something. So the Lord Jesus Christ told us to go out, Susie and I, into the streets and get them. It didn't make any difference uh, who they were or what they were, what color they were, or how much money they had. He said, preach the gospel to every creature on the face of the earth. I graduated from high school in 1969 in Forest Lake, Minnesota, working, paying my bills, just living every day as a young graduate from high school. My drug of choice at that time was on the weekends, LSD. We decided, my friend and I, that we were gonna go to California. So we hitchhiked. We went down to Hollywood Boulevard and we ran into the people from the Tony and Susan Alamo Foundation 
handing out little pieces of paper that said repent or perish. I didn't think I was searching, you know, but it seemed cool. I first heard the name Tony Susan Malamo in 1970. I was 17 years old. And my brother, a year older than me, told me, I'm gonna serve the Lord. And I couldn't believe it, because Bob and I were very close growing up. And we didn't have any religion in our family. And he just says, no, I know it's the truth, Gary. And I said, I'm gonna go up there and check this place out with you. We went to church with them. When I walked in, I was mind blown because it was people my age. They were all young, hippies, college people. They sang gospel songs and they all knew the words. They vibrate your body in there raising their hands and rolling their eyes and they're crazy, Jesus. And my brother's standing there doing the same thing. And then they start talking to you about laying down your life to serve the Lord. I was sitting next to Susan Lama and I said, I'm gonna try this out for one semester. So that's what I want, you know, and I want to see if it's real. And she tilted her head back and she cackled like a hyena. She said, this is going to be the longest semester of your life. She, she was right. The word of God says, I love them who fear me. The mind control, the absolute control. I fell under the power of this. Amen. Yeah. My mother was Susan Alamo. She's actually the founder. Tony was just kind of extra baggage. Yeah, she started this mess. Mama wanted to be a movie star. When she came to Los Angeles, she got a job as a beat girl. You look pretty, you sit at the bar. The bartender gives you some tea in an alcohol glass. You drink that, and the guy who wants to talk to you has to pay for that, which he believes is a drink. My mother had a knack where she could walk into a room full of people, and I swear to you, everyone would look. Along the way, Susan realized that she had a way of getting attention in churches, of testifying to inspire people. She was a good con artist. She would say, okay, listen, we're doing a church tonight. So we would go to one of the churches that knew her. The pastor would say, you know, you wanna spread the word a bit? I would sing, and then she would give this incredible testimony about how her and her little girl have been in Mexico preaching to the people down there. The fact of the matter was we hadn't gone anywhere. We were right in the middle of um, either Los Angeles or Hollywood. We called it doing a church. That's how we survived. I was raised by Tony and Sue. People did consider me Tony and Susan's son. Tony would drop stories about his formative years. There was no consistent identity to this human being, to this man. Tony had already changed his name from Bernie Lazar Hoffman to Marcus Abad to Marcus Hoffman to Tony Alamo. He was shifting all over the place. 
he had one of those paths of lots of trails of lies. At one point, he said he was a big record producer. He actually had the chutzpah to say that he promoted the Beatles. <laughs> I was in the record industry and also did promotions for the movies. Wild. I mean, when I tell you wild, it was really something. I was probably 13, 14 years old, and I could sing. My mother was a good scam artist, but she needed a front man. Anytime she saw anybody who might have anything to do with the music business, she was on them, okay? She wanted to try to get me a deal, get herself a deal. And I'm sitting at a bar called Aldo's with my mom, Tony, comes in there. My mother says, so you in the music business? And he said, oh, listen, I've done everything in the music business. And he's schmoozing her because he figures she's got money. Mother always presented beautifully. She did. But she thinks he's got money. And neither one of them can pay for the big pitcher of beer. OK? <laughs> she leans over to him and says, Tony, did you know that Jesus Christ is coming back to Earth again? He really didn't know the Bible. So she started teaching him about the Bible. And up to that point, he actually has said that he really didn't like women, that he really hated women. But this was a woman that was altogether different. I love to talk about Susie. She's my love, my life. You want to tell us? She's the greatest lady that ever lived, and is for that matter, the greatest person that I ever know. And then when we got married, I says, God has got to love me more than anybody in the world. They'd be driving along, like Hollywood and Vine, and he would say, what do you want to do with all this nasty people? And she would say, come on, we're going to talk to them. Think about the restoration of your soul, and where will it spend eternity? This is the greatest question that you are ever going to answer in your life, is when the angel of death comes to call upon me, or when this old earth begins to rock and shake, and again fulfill prophecy. I was just caught in the world, and I was really lost. And she looked at me in the eyes, and she said, you know it's the truth. And that just like sunk right deep inside of my heart, and I knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that she had, she had the power of God plus the truth. And then they started saving people and taking them to the ocean and dipping them in the water to baptize them. And he bought into that, but not because he bought into God. He bought into that because he saw the money they could earn. He was business. She was gospel. That became a collision of two very dangerous people into one who then created this foundation, this religious foundation and they never looked back. Did I think it would go this far? Yeah. But I was even astounded at how vicious it was. Tony and Susan created this community. And young people have joined, believing that they have found Happiness, joy, the Lord. And they came in. They never went back out. They ended up with a house on Crescent Heights and Sunset. All the kids would hang there. And the police came often and messed with them. Susan Alamo did not like the West Hollywood Sheriff's Department, which had jurisdiction there. They were coming down on the unsanitary conditions. 
They were violating so many, so many codes. There was a lot of suspicion of what was going on there, but she wanted to get away. There was some property in Saugus Canyon, which is about 45 minutes away from Hollywood. And they bought that and moved up there. And that became then a place where they could literally remove the converts and totally control their lives. A streetcar named Heaven moves through Charles Manson country north of Los Angeles, carrying a load full of joy and baffling belief. The Jesus Church from the Susan and Tony Alamo Christian Foundation. Their commune's main source of income is received when a convert sells his earthly goods and hands in the money. How do you support yourselves? I mean, admittedly, that when people come to join you, they give you all their worldly goods. I suppose no, that... most of them don't have a thing. No. Most of them don't have a thing. I'll make a deal with you. Every hippie that comes to the church with money and possessions, I'll put salt and pepper on him and eat him if you'll eat the ones, the other ones. Would you do that? <laughs> Most of them don't even have shoes on their feet. You know, not all of these kids came from poor surroundings, believe me. And, uh, boy, they'd find out that somebody had some big money. <laughs> all of a sudden, they'd be going, I see such a great work of God with you. We needed to pay the bills. We need the finances so we can get the gospel out. So we started working hoeing cotton, picking grapes, lopping roses, and all the paychecks went to Tony and Sue. I got paid every week. I got a paycheck with my name on it. And every Friday, they came to you wherever you were at, if you were in the fields, if you were in the dorms, gave you a pen, you signed your name on the back of it. I mean, you're told, praise the Lord, you know, who cares about money? You got two, 300 people doing that. Signing over 200 to $500 paychecks, you get rich pretty damn quick. They needed to create a nonprofit organization to keep the money and live the lifestyle that they wanted. Otherwise, they would have probably lost a good portion to the federal government, to the IRS. Jesus' children in his commune live in squalid conditions, the fortunate sleeping in bunks 20 or 30 to a room. However, Tony and Susan, as befits absolute leaders, are adequately housed. But we never worked hard enough. You're lazy. You were never good enough. After my son was born, I was so tired. I couldn't even hold my baby in my arms. I felt like he was just going to fall out on the floor. Susie, when she talked about the mothers, you might as well put the F word to the end of that because it was almost like, you mothers, you're so lazy. We didn't have pampers, we had cloth diapers, but a lot of times there wasn't water, so you couldn't rinse out the diapers, so then they'd get maggots. So the next thing you know, you're getting over the pulpit, you lazy mothers letting maggots in your baby's diapers. I mean, it was really hard. But I really did think Tony and Sue were prophets. They can talk to God, and God talks to them, but God doesn't talk to us. I never heard his voice, but they heard his voice, and we believed it. She was the body of Christ on earth. She was the prophetess. She was the handmaiden of God. She was that close to God. In so many ways, Tony and Susan Lawo became higher than God. Amen? Yeah. I am a living testimony this afternoon that Jesus Christ is a healer. I've had The some... stories just became more and more outlandish. Well, she had faked cancer for years. She had. I've had terminal cancer for almost six years now. I am standing here this afternoon because you believe God. Praise the Lord. And so we were always praying for Susie. And then we were always being told over time, God uses Susie as a barometer to the health of the church. She was suffering for our sins of the cult, of the congregation. 
Our sins is what was making her have cancer. She had these kids in the foundation on their knees praying. And she'd give me a call and say, uh, yeah, be ready to go. Uh, I've got some shopping I have to do. And then we'd go over to I Magnus or Saks, and she'd try on dresses, have everything altered perfectly. And these kids are like, they're hysterical. They're so afraid she's going to die. If she'd have gone into any other business, I could have said, that's business. But it wasn't. This was horrible, harmful, deadly. One of the phenomena of the late 60s and 70s is the spread of religious cults. Opponents of the cult say they get and keep their members through mind control. I had a national practice assisting the victims of cults and authoritarian groups of various kinds. In the 19, late 1960s through the 1970s, there were a lot of families with family members who became members of these groups and cut themselves off. Many spouses and family members decided to go to the media thinking that publicity would reveal the terrible thing that's happening and that they could get their loved one out. That never works to my knowledge. I was a journalist, 27, 28 years old. Cults were a bit of my beat. It seemed to me that somebody should do a story from the inside. What we had heard about the foundation was that there was brainwashing, there was beatings. And so I just walked down Hollywood and Highland looking a little bit forlorn. And I was approaching and asked if I wanted to get on the bus. I had gone there for Holy Week leading up to Easter Sunday. Susan gave a really remarkable speech. She saw in her mind this image of Jesus coming down in a red cape and his black, black eyes looking into her. Some people believe Susan was a total con. I think that she had some belief in her heart. But I did see 125 people sleeping in a room just about this big. I saw that it was almost impossible to take a shower. The food was bad, but I never saw any beatings. I did not see any kind of brainwashing. But of course, if they're beating people, they don't want me to, to know it. They want me to stay around. You know, They want me to see the, the very best of what they had to offer. First of all, we were all good actors. So whenever the public was involved, you just put on an act because we knew what needed to be shown. And then Tony and Sue were filming television shows. Hello again, Tony and Susan Alamo coming your way with another one half hour of gospel songs and testimonies. Tony, my God is real. Amen, Susie. Our God is real. Praise the Lord. Maestro. Jesus has a table spread. They would have music, and then she would have people from the church doing their testimonials. I've never been so happy in all my life. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You're, if you're on a trip, you're on a good one, aren't you? Amen. <laughs> and they would never not do what they were told to do. Let's talk to the people that are here today. And Tony and Susie would get people who weren't against the church to be on the syndicated show. Both of my parents got saved by Tony and Susie. My dad was a heroin addict. After getting saved, he said that the desire for heroin completely left him. My grandparents got their son back. Mrs. Levy, what was the first thing that you noticed when you came to the church after Bill had come there? My son looked at me with the, for the first time with clear eyes and with just pure love in it. So my grandparents were for the church. Had they not been, my parents would have been exiled from my grandparents and not allowed to speak to them. So as long as they didn't make waves, 
they would have access to my dad. Have you ever had any problems with being able to see your son? No problems whatsoever. You come and go at your own will and always have. Right. Well, praise the Lord. When I got up there, yes, I was expecting to be able to spend time with my brother and talk to him. But my brother and I were separated. After a little while, I met a girl and I fell in love. And I became more or less institutionalized into the labor, the work, and you just quit thinking. You don't use your own discernment. The only discernment of right and wrong is what the cult leaders tell you. And then they test, they test everything. What can I get away with? What would they allow? Susie was talking and it's not rumors. She told me, when your kids get too big to spank, you slap them across the face. And it was like, it's better to beat your child with a rod to save them from hell. At the Saugus property, there was a little room off to the side in the back behind the church where certain parents would take their kids. And it was instructions from Tony and Susan Malamo, your child is devil possessed. You need to beat the devil out of them. I didn't know that this stuff went on. I wanted to make damn sure that they never ended up with my kids. And I thought, I've got to get out of here. That's what I have to do. I have to get out of here with my kids. I was 20. I went up to see my mom. I said, I need to leave. Anything you ever want from me, I'll do. But I want to get my kids out of there. She said, you know way too much about how everything's done, what's where and who's who. She said, so you're not going anywhere. And she said, I'll kill you before I let you do that. I uh, went downstairs. I was really panicking. I was trying to get things together for the kids. Anything I could find to pack. Just to go. I hear banging on the doors. It was some of the boys from the foundation. And they came in, and I'm trying to hold my kids so that they don't get hurt. And my mother, my mother got behind two of these boys and she'd come up over their shoulders and scratch me or grab my hair. They beat the crap out of me. And when I came to, my kids were gone. And I called the cops. So these cops went up into my mother's house, and they get a hold of my oldest daughter. But the little one, her father was in the foundation, so he snatched her. They took my oldest daughter and I to the police station. They're just getting ready to photograph me. And the, one of the cops on the desk said, there's a phone call for you. It's this lawyer, and he said, uh, if you don't sign anything, you don't put any kind of a, a charge against them, then you can come and get your youngest child. What are you going to do? <laughs> what, what? Of course you're going to go get your child. And uh, I went to take her, and my mother said, I warned you. I warned you. You really blew it. And I said, yeah, well, that's how it works. And I got her, and I got in the car and punched it. And we left them standing in this, this wall of dirt. We proceeded to just move and move and move and move. But I was always afraid for the kids. Chris. There was a major smear campaign against her. It was almost like, if you thought any good thought about Chris, you were blaspheming the Holy Ghost. You were blaspheming against God.
And there isn't ever any peace in the life of anyone who has ever known Jesus Christ to try to go back into a world of sin and drunkenness and all those things. It's, it's a terrible existence. The message is, if you leave here, you're going to be punished. You need to stay with us. So Saugus became large, and Tony needed to start thinking about moving somewhere else because the law was starting to scrutinize him. The Word of God also says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Susan Lama did not want the scrutiny of California State, the IRS, the Labor Department, and stuff. She wanted to get away where maybe things weren't quite so regulated. But what we were told was we need to go back to where the gospel was strong, you know, the Bible Belt. We're getting ready to build a big new church. Amen? The move from California to Arkansas was like the great exodus. They just took off and drove across the country and uh, went back to Arkansas where Susan Lamo grew up where she had a supernatural experience with God. I was born and raised in the Bible Belt, state of Arkansas. I was nine years old when God came down from the heavens and touched my little body, racked with tuberculosis, dying, touched me and healed me in a non-believing, unsaved house. Now that story, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of versions of that story. She hated Arkansas. She felt she had been treated badly. That was one of the reasons she went back to Arkansas after she'd uh, gotten into the millions. Um, she was going to uh, show them. Plus she knew the lay of the land. I-40 went from the East Coast to the West Coast, but there was a break in I-40, right in Alma, Arkansas. So it was a perfect stop for a restaurant, for gas. It's very close to Texas, very close to Oklahoma. So should the law scrutinize them even more closely, they could move their children, move their population very quickly to another state and be out of that state's jurisdiction. I was told that I was gonna take part in establishing an accounting system for the cult. And funds and assets would get juggled around. And there became holding companies, and there became offshore accounts and corporations. It just became a spider web of next to impossible, you know, trail to follow. And you know, so Tony said if the IRS came in, you know, they'd have a big mess. I was a special agent with IRS Criminal Investigation Division. Churches are not for profit, and uh, they're not subject to taxes. The uh, Tony and Susan Lamo Foundation, they were engaged in numerous for-profit commercial businesses. All the way back to 1970, uh, there were revenues were $46,000. And by 1975, it was over a million dollars. Lamo says that the businesses show a loss each year. He says they were never intended to make a profit, but were started just to meet the needs of the foundation volunteers. They're all volunteers, and uh, they have become born-again Christians, and people that are really born again. They don't believe that they uh, need to be paid to serve the Lord. They weren't paying the uh, employees, even though they were working 12 to 15 hour days, five, six, seven days a week. The Department of Labor filed a lawsuit in 1977 alleging that they should have been paying as much as $19 million in wages. Uh, the disciple of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ never felt that they needed to get a paycheck. The George Ridge property was separated from everything. Gated, there's, there's two entrances. Both of them, we have vehicles and we have watchmen. 
everything was monitored. You couldn't walk around anywhere without somebody being with you. You had no time to yourself. You, know, you had to read Bible and Bible groups and everything. And you had to listen to tapes, Tony and Susan Malamo, and they're preaching. If you don't repent, you will perish. If you don't do what they say, you were going to burn in hell after you died for eternity. But we were adults. We made a cognitive choice. These ones were born into there. They never had a choice. This stopped being anything to do with the grown-ups years ago. So one child after the other, no birth control. It guaranteed that the Foundation members couldn't get out. You want to go and do the recreational area? Yeah. OK, yeah. let's go up there now. Hello. Hi. Hi. Mr. Andrasak. <laughs> Papa Tony. <laughs> How you doing, Fatty? How are you, Thomas? You doing okay today? That's great. Yeah. Our group of kids, there were 24 of us, which was a lot. That's a lot of brand new babies. <laughs> and we were all born within days, weeks, and months of each other. Tony and Susie provided us with food, shelter, clothing. They told us when we would be rewarded. They told us when we were going to be punished. Tony and Susie were our gods. Grandma Susie, she was very much my mom. Growing up my entire life, I was told that my biological mother it was just this woman that had me and, you know, eventually died and was burning in hell for committing a sin. And so that was very accepted. I just, there were no questions asked. After that, I was then raised by Tony and Sue. So from four to seven, you know, I slept in the spec house. I ate in the spec house. You know, that was my home. It was called the spec house for whatever tax purposes. That's where all the reports went down. Tony and Susan had a reporting system. When somebody thought they saw you do something wrong, they would write you on report and it would go to Tony and Sue. So it kind of kept everybody in line because you could be separated from your family, you could be thrown out in the street. Children reported their parents, parents put their children on report. We also told on our own selves because, you know, we didn't want to go to hell. Tony drilled on us on hell every single day. Hell was moments away, everlasting hell. I used to have nightmares when Tony would teach about hell. I would have nightmares of demons. I used to grind my teeth because of the fear. I would like lay there and pray and ask God to forgive me. And then I'd have a bad thought pop into my head. And I would say, oh, God, please forgive me, please forgive me. And every time it would pop in my head, it meant I was going to hell. When the report started going down and the kids and the spanking started, wow, that was brutal. And it was like, Susie said, it has got to be right, you know? They wouldn't tell you to do something wrong. You know, my mother knew how to beat the hell out of you. Seriously. And when I was a kid, I would come home from school and she'd be drinking earlier in the day, running a, an iron over something. She always had long, bright red nails. And she'd have a beer and a cigarette. And I'd come in the door and I'd say, hi, mama. And she'd go, hi, mama. Get over here. Don't you know God shows me everything you do? She said, why do you make me do this to you? That's where she learned to treat those kids like that. 
When I saw kids being beaten, yes, I felt sorry for them, but yes, I also thought, you deserve that. Like, God is trying to save your soul. God issued the beatings. It wasn't a madman issuing beatings. It was God. So after he was done breaking our minds and our spirits, then it was time to break our body. Masaka Everybody. Yeah, 
Yes, lock me with the snap. Nerf scene and all the shit knife and they stay sees me. I 
opening an ocean. And now to open ship cells with... Snook. We almost have a single laugh for it. Snook. You should use that snook in the line of it. And she gets to read next to me. My patricia will have to help with the help and it. Oh, my lord, it is. That's the same name. This fault. Me. Seals, but no. I'm going to stick you up. There's this. This the honest earth, no, so I have to fight it in it. Oh, I have no more fun yet. No, I miss it. It's not Oh, look, the house, the sniper. The knife, I hit that nivy look. The house, the. Oh, this night, the night. You didn't mean me. Said the day, this is the night. So, what's the shift work that? Didn't wait, it's gonna be easy without them. Fine. Our officer, the work, no, we can get without it. I have to learn it tonight. She had not said to live something. She had not said that air from it. No, it wasn't it. Well, we certainly had to hear it. But, no, she looked up. Meh, get bad. Off side, so we should. it, so we. Merrick, get the end of the policy. So, get bad, this net off me. The hog, this net off me. So, get on the. Yes, sir. Boy, fourth make and a gash and forward smack it through us in the world. Yeah, no, below, but smack. Fight, fellas, and yeah, it's not upset. Fear no, near us, not at your grave, or who's that? My chucks are there, that's it. You're the nurse, the inlaps, the oil. Oh, now, what's your time is here, what's here, what's that, but yeah. My sister, I'm not Yes, the wish, Nick. Oh, be be saying. So what the reason we do? Yes, the wish. No, 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 Yeah, <laughs> so I played luck her out, but this is my Oh, he's dead faster, right? Oh, he's dead. Then he back to the arch, no wish. Yeah, man. Man, I was a wish. Since if you see him, but I wish didn't think of anything. Ooh, you know, you know, she's smashing it. I'm in our foot, did he wish? No, so I don't like snow, because I'm with him, man. Yeah, stick on it. Oh, so he's going to finish the rest of the work, so. Wow, we are going to win. Wow. See the little dwarfs and the shore, but they just saw an ear, so they don't have any silver. Sorry, but the number of people that sit up snuck on the hair, 
Sell was left. First, I'll be safe. So, the